Technology is something we use every day to work, to play, and even just to communicate with others. There are a lot of different varieties and options we can choose to utilize technology with. Despite its prevalence in our lives, not many people actually know a lot about the technology they even use. You may know that, you know, your smartphone allows you to connect with others via the internet or through telephone. You may also know that you can have a lot of entertaining mediums, such as movies and even video games. Despite the sort of ubiquity of technology, as I said before, it's not really fully understood. We may not understand the underlying decisions and actions with a lot of technology. And today, I sort of want to talk about one snippet, one small yet infuriating experience with technology, and it's the word port. Now, when some people hear the word port, they might think of the English word, which is sort of like having ships arrive and depart with supplies. However, <laughs> English is a pretty interesting language, right? And there are a lot of different meanings. Some people more familiar with technology and care a lot about Apple's removal of the headphone jack and other ports, they think of the word as sort of USB standards or perhaps SD card, micro SD card. However, the word port that I want to use today refers to the action of moving one program from one platform to another. So what does that mean? Well, to give an analogy, you could imagine a software as sort of like a building. And so a building, of course, requires a foundation. And while generally foundations are made of concrete nowadays, you may discover that you may want to build something on a sandy foundation or perhaps just a dirt foundation. And so can you just build the exact same building on the exact, you know, the exact same way? No, you really can't because the foundation is different. And so if we were to apply this foundation and building analogy to software, we would discover that the foundation is the software's platform operating system. You may have heard of it. You may not. It's okay, though. But the foundation is basically what your computer runs on. It's your Windows, your Mac OS, your Android, your iOS. And so with the platform, app developers, coders, can build a lot of buildings for it the apps. However, when they try to move one app to another, of course, it's much easier than construction. You can copy and paste the code. However, just copy and pasting the exact same code onto new foundation may not result in the exact same experience. It may be dangerous. I would, I personally wouldn't live on a sandy foundation, for example, without full reassurance from the engineers. And here's something to remember. Coding is also engineering. There's a lot of thought and processes behind the code itself. It's not some sort of magic. And I kind of want to talk about just perhaps some insight into why it's not magic and sort of, yeah, just talk about some of the problems that arise from porting. So we know that you can't copy and paste buildings, right, on the different foundations. And so porting is basically retooling the building to accommodate the foundation. Sounds simple, right? Well, with code, it may not be as simple. Sure, sometimes it is pretty easy. Let's say porting one program on Android to a different Android phone, it's pretty easy. In fact, there may be no issues at all just copy and pasting the code. However, if you want to say run, let's say a Windows program, it doesn't matter what it is. If you want to run a Windows program on your Android phone, you may not even know how to start, like how do I download it? And even if you have the Windows program on your phone, you may find it incredibly difficult to run. It may not open. And that's because the platforms are different. The foundation's different. And so the same building will have to be retooled for Android because the platform's foundations are so different. And so why am I talking about this? Well, first off, I have a sort of a personal anecdote, which I think is a pretty interesting case. So. Over the summer, I learned that I would be learning virtually. And so this isn't really a big deal, although one thing I did miss was the dorm life, the sort of social aspect, talking with other students, and of course my friends. And so what ended up happening was that some students at Stanford developed a web extension called Sesame to actually try, at least try to recreate this dorm life. 
Now, of course, it won't be exact, you know, the exact same, but it really does help alleviate the sort of isolation many felt, especially at the start, knowing that they wouldn't see their friends potentially for two semesters. And so what's the problem with Sesame? Well, nothing if you use Google Chrome, but I don't use Google Chrome. I use Firefox and I've been using Firefox for the past few years. So I sort of had a fork at my feet. I could either give up Firefox and a lot of the things I liked about it, particularly just the sort of, um, yeah, <laughs> I won't go into the specifics, but I could either give up Firefox or I could give up Sesame, both of which I didn't really want to do. And so I just found the really frustrating ex experience of the issues with porting. Not with porting itself, but the lack of porting and general compatibility. And so what can you do when you find yourself in this situation? Well, you have three general options. You can either just wait for an official port to be released, you can try to find an alternative, or you can try porting it yourself or find other community members who can port it. So while I won't talk explicitly about what I did right now, I'll talk about the first step, just waiting. Not the step, but the first option. So what's the benefit of waiting? Well, you get official support. You get a stance from the company that says, we support software on this platform. We support Microsoft Word on Mac OS. We support Instagram on Android. So having an official stance from the company is definitely reassuring. And along with this official stance is support. You know that you can always just call up support and ask, hey, there's a problem with the code and they'll help you through it. Now there is one really big downside and it's waiting. You have no real power over the developers and for good reason. After all, the developers have to make decisions to keep their app afloat. And if not enough people use a platform, let's say, um, BlackBerry. Let's say <laughs> there's not a lot of apps for BlackBerry because there's not a lot of users demanding for apps on BlackBerry phones, for example. And so it just doesn't make sense to spend so much time debugging, you know, polishing up, porting the code, the building, remember, onto a platform which not many people are going to use. It makes more sense to just appeal and add new features to a larger audience. And so that's the big problem with the first version. You just kind of have to wait and hope. <laughs> and so what about the second option, finding alternative? alternative? Well, alternatives can definitely get the job done. If you have a time sensitive task, you may just have to find an alternative software. And so for example, let's say Adobe Premiere was not available on Linux, for example. Well, you would have to find an alternative software like KDE and Live. And although you may gripe about how it's different, how some parts of it are different from Premiere, you can still get the job done. You can still edit your video. And in fact, you may actually grow fond of this alternative software. And option two is more of like a bridge between not having a port of your favorite software and having a port. And so during this time, you may grow more fond of this alternative software, or you may just remember why you like your original software in the first place. Regardless, alternative software, it's not going to be the same. <laughs> and that's something that a lot of people aren't really willing to give up. And so what about the last option? Well, this is actually creating your own port, or at least finding some way to support software on unsupported platforms. And so how can you do this? Well, the most thorough way is to somehow have the program and take it apart like a chair. You take the chair apart, you take the building apart, and then you design the modifications yourself to actually support different foundations. And so obviously this takes a lot of skill and knowledge in the field, which not everybody really has the time or capabilities to do so. And also there's no support. If something goes wrong, you have to figure out what's wrong. And that can take hours out of time, your day, especially if that's not your job. That's just frustrating for many. And so what are some other uh, community made ports, for example? Well, you can sort of sideload software. And for example, I'll actually talk about the option I chose when I came across this fork. I created a sort of port in quotes. It's not the same port as I mentioned before, the thoroughness of actually taking apart the code 
and modifying it to work for Firefox. Instead, I actually found a way to sort of sideload Sesame. I am able to open Chrome up really fast, close Google Chrome, and just have Sesame remain as a separate window, even with the Sesame icon, which I thought was pretty cool. And so, as a result, there's some advantages of actually doing something like this. For example, you don't really need to update your own code every time an official update comes out. But there are a lot of downsides, obviously. For example, it's a lot more, there's a lot more setup to go into it. And they, that also might not be something people are really looking forward to. So some people may ask, okay, that's a lot of talk for something that probably doesn't affect me. Well, that's true for now. However, a lot of companies and a lot of organizations are looking into a lot of different platforms. So you may have heard of this small company called Apple. They make a few electronic devices here and there. Um, and they, they, yeah, they make some accessories. And so Apple is actually working on a new architecture, a new platform, a new foundation. And you may have heard of it. It's called the M1 chip. And so for those who are unfamiliar, M1 is essentially completely different from your traditional computer processing unit. It relies on different foundations and all the buildings around it are completely different. And even though Apple has a translating layer, which is really cool and really effective, it's, it will never be the same as a building designed for that foundation. It's sort of a band-aid to help the transition. Instead of people trying to find alternative software, they can run their favorite software. <laughs> That's a lot of softwares, isn't it? But they can run their favorite programs on Apple M1 at a slight performance cost for now, instead of having to find an alternative. And so you may say, okay, Apple has found a solution, so why should I care still? Well, Risk Five is a much more obscure platform, but there's a lot of research going into it. And in five, 10 years, you may find yourself using a device that uses Risk Five, and you may have to face the issue of ports. <laughs> you may find yourself at this three-way pathway. But in the end, what's really important is to really figure out that despite what companies try to say, that technology is magic, surprise, there are humans that coded it. They're not wizards. They're also just, they're just engineers. And like the chair, hammers, houses, basically anything that people make, you can always take it apart. You can always, you can always ask, why is it built like this? Why can't I do this? The magic isn't in the product. The magic is in the questions that we ask.